Hi, my name is Toby, and today I'm going to talk about how Project Valhalla is bringing performance to Java developers. So a little bit about myself. I'm a developer on the OpenJ9VM team um, based in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, in the past, I've worked on projects like JSR 335, Modularity, and currently I am um, part of the Valhalla Experts Group, uh, where I work with other developers and collaborate on Project Valhalla. So the goal of today's presentation is to answer four, que four questions. Um, what is Project Valhalla? Um, what is the problem that it's trying to solve? And then I'll introduce inline types and show how it solves these problems. And then I'll talk about the future of the Project Valhalla and where it's going. So what is Project Valhalla? Um, Project Valhalla is a collaborative effort. It's done in OpenJDK. Um, to summarize it, I'll borrow a quote from Brian Getz. So the goal of Project Valhalla is to bring more flexible, flattened data types to the JVM languages, to bring the programming model back in line with the performance characteristics of modern hardware. So there are two main points here. The first is that there is currently a shortcoming in the JVM that doesn't allow the JVM to make the most of modern hardware. And I'll discuss this in greater detail. Um, the next major point is that in order to solve this problem, we need to find a way to express flattened data types to the JVM. Um, so that's basically the goal of Project Valhalla. And this will be realized by a series of JEPs, um, the main ones being inline types and specialized generics. So as the previous slide alluded to, currently the Java type system doesn't quite fit well with the performance characteristics of modern hardware. Uh, in the past couple decades, CPUs have been able to do more, um, process more instructions per cycle than ever. However, memory latencies haven't improved as much. Um, so memory latency tends to be the biggest bottleneck for Java application performance. Here are some latency numbers from a Core i7 uh, from 5th gen uh, Xeon. Um, all of these numbers represent the optimistic case. Um, so these are the best case scenarios for for the, um, for the memory uh, types. So at the top, um, we have registers. Um, so it's typically a single cycle. Um, and as you can see, when you go down to L1, L2, L3, the, the amount of time it takes to do the memory load um, takes longer. And then when you go to RAM, there's a this bit of a jump, and there's an even bigger jump when you go to SSD. So basically, this table shows that it pays to have condensed data where temporal and spatial locality are aligned. Um, this basically means that you want to have the data that you'll access together to be stored together, to, to be stored in memory together. Uh, as soon as you have to move up to a higher tier or a higher cache, um, then you, you pay the latency cost. So this is typically what a Java heap looks like. Um, there's lots of references everywhere. Um, lots of points are chasing. This is not very cache efficient because um, objects are not necessarily uh, positioned spatially near each other. So you often have to jump between different cache lines to, to load a field. Um, so with an object graph that looks like this, there's a high likelihood of cache misses, um, and which is detrimental to performance as we saw in the chart uh, before this. Um, another problem with this picture is that there's a lot of object headers and that contributes to footprints. A large footprint makes it less likely that you'll be able to fit all the related data in the same cache line, uh, making cache misses more probable. Also, it means that um, you're using more memory, so you end up having more GCs, which also reduces performance. So this is what Project Valhalla is attempting to solve. It's attempting to fix this picture and make it more hardware friendly. So the main solution to this problem is flattening. Um, this is where you take a reference field and place it within its structure. So in other words, you flatten it within its container. So here's a little example. Um, we have points that has two fields, X and Y, and we have line, which is composed of two points. Um, when you flatten point within its container, you're essentially taking the two points and putting it within line, as you can see in this diagram. So on the left, we have the, the reference layout, and on the right, we have the flattened layout. As you can see on the right, there's less points to chasing. Well, there's no points to chasing in this case because 
um, the, the data is within the container. And um, there's less footprints because we don't need the headers for points and we don't have the references to point. So this flattened representation takes up less space. Um, you can do something similar with arrays. So on the left, we have uh, a points array and it has references to each of the elements. On the right is a flattened representation where each of the elements are placed within the body of the array. Um, so this is a more performant way to, to represent arrays in memory. So what are inline types and how does it help? Well, before we, we dive into inline types, I'll first uh, motivate why we had the, the reference problem. And I'll show how inline types solves that problem. So one of the great things about the Java language is identity. Identity is useful because it allows one to keep track of state. A Java object has identity, so even if its state mutates, it still remains the same object. And this is a very appealing feature for software developers, which is why object-oriented languages like Java are very popular. Um, it means you can perform identity operations like acquiring a monitor in any object. Um, however, there are some cases where um, you don't need identity, as the value of the object does not mutate within its lifetime, or if you're simply using an object as a data carrier. Um, but in these cases, you still have to pay the cost of identity. So one of the biggest challenges in dealing with identity are references. In order to maintain a single view of an object state, you need to have a reference to that object. So everyone refers to the same thing. So as a result, references are everywhere in the JVM. Um, when the JVM allocates an object, it returns a reference to that object. And when the object is pushed onto the stack, it is a reference to the object that's post pushed on the stack as opposed to the object itself. And if an object has object fields, then you, the fields themselves are references. And um, for types like hash table, which contains an object array, there are even more references. And in, in these cases, you know, the, the elements themselves have more references. And eventually, you end up with this uh, object graph that I showed you earlier. So the, the solution to this is inline types. Inline types are essentially objects that behave like primitives. Um, hence the tagline, codes like a class and works like an int. Um, the important part here is that it works like an int, specifically the performance aspects of an int. Um, so inline types, um, this is the current working name. Um, in the past, it's been called value types. Um, so it, it refers to the same thing. Um, so inline types have three main characteristics. The first one is that they're identityless. As we saw in the previous slides, identity is the reason why we have um, a lot of references today. Um, but inline types are identityless. So a lot of those things we have to do to preserve identity, we don't have to do anymore. Um, identityless means that an instance of a type which has the same content is the indistinguishable from all other instances of that type with the same content. Um, so if, it, if the payload's the same, it's the same thing. Um, immutability means that an instance cannot change once it's been created. So once you create it, that's it for, forever. If you want it to change, you have to create a new instance. And flattenable means that the JVM is free to embed or inline a field within its container. Um, so as you can see, inline types have a lot of the same characteristics as primitive types. Primitive types are immutable. Um, they, they don't have identity. Um, so one way of looking at inline types is you know, as programmable primitives. Um, or you can think of them as restri restricted classes. Um, so they, they work kind of like classes, but um, the restrictions make them more performant than classes. So here is a little illustration. Uh, let's say we define a point with two fields, x and y. And we define a line with two point fields start and end, uh, just as in our previous example. The layout would look something like this in today's world. But if you convert points to an inline type, instead of the disjointed layout, we have a contiguous layout. The two points are placed in line within the line object, which means better footprints and better cache locality. 
also um, the two point fields do not have identity, which means um, they can benefit from better optimizations by the JIT. So what changed? How did we get all of this improvement? Well, a single keyword was added. Uh, in red, you can see inline. This was prepended uh, to the class definition. And what this does is it indicates that this, this type is an inline type. So it means that the type is now flattenable, it's immutable, and it's identity less. Um, and then we get all the benefits that we want. So, um, so some of the other characteristics of inline types, um, we've seen that they're immutable, identity less, and flattenable, but um, they can also define methods. Uh, so unlike primitive types, uh, which needs to be boxed to the object uh, equivalents in order to call methods in them. Inline types don't need this. You can define methods and you can call methods in them directly. Um, they can implement interfaces. They can imp implement abstract classes with uh, some restrictions. Um, these abstract, abstract classes cannot have any fields and they need to have an empty uh, init method. Um, they subclass object, and they also support um, the object APIs, like equals to string. But their behavior is a little different because they, they don't have identity. Um, so inline types are great because they allow you to define data aggregates. However, there are some trade-offs when using inline types. Um, as I said earlier, you can kind of think of them as restricted classes. So inline types cannot be subclassed since an inline type may be flattened within its container. Um, allowing inline types to be subclassed would mean that um, a flattenable type may have um, variable size storage. Uh, so for this reason, it's not allowed. Uh, since inline types are identityless, you can't perform any identity operations on them, like synchronizing on them or defining instance uh, synchronized methods. Inline types also do not implement clonable since um, inline types are identityless. Uh, cloning is inconsequential. It's, a, it's like trying to clone a primitive. Um, similarly, they can't define finalizers since finalization is a mechanism tied to the lifetime of, a, of an instance. And since inline types don't have identity, they don't have lifetimes. Um, so the, the, the concept of finalization doesn't work with inline types. So as previously mentioned, um, inline types are flattenable, which means they can be flattened within the container. Um, as a consequence of flattening, uh, inline types are not nullable, meaning that you cannot assign null to an inline type container. Um, when, when a field is flattened, all the data is used to represent the, the, the bytes of the, the instance. So there's no way to represent null since an all zero um, memory is a, is a valid instance of the type. All the bits are used up to represent the data, essentially. In addition, inline, type cannot, inline types cannot have instance fields that refer to themselves either directly or indirectly. Since an inline type may be flattened, it's impossible to determine the flattened layout of an inline type that recursively defines itself. Um, so for that reason, it's not allowed. Also, flattened fields are preloaded, um, so loaded before the, the container, um, as you need to know the size of the field before you can create an instance of the container. So this is very similar to preloading a superclass or interfaces before loading the type. Um, so these are some of the restrictions. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the JVM that determines whether the, the field is flattened or not. Um, the JVM will attempt to flatten as much as possible, uh, as much as it's beneficial. However, if the, the type is too large, that it's too difficult to allocate the type, or the, the particular architecture that's being run on doesn't have large enough registers to, to load the type efficiently, then the JVM may decide to not uh, flatten it. So um, let's look at how the Java hierarchy uh, looks like with uh, inline types. So at the top is Java Lang object. And 
To the left, we have inline types. This is the new types that we've introduced. And to the right, um, there is a new interface called identity object. Now, this is the current working name. Um, what it'll be called in the future is still up for debate. But essentially, all types today um, that currently subclass um, JavaLang object will, um, will now implement the identity object interface. And this is to distinguish them from identity-less inline types. Um, so in cases where you need to know if it's safe to perform an identity-sensitive operation, there'll be an interface that will indicate whether these operations are supported or not. To the right, we have primitives. Um, so primitives are, are separate. There are distinct types today. They don't really play nicely with the rest of the Java world. If you want to use them with generics, for example, you, you have to box it to the, to the um, to container type. Um, so they're, they're very difficult to use. But one of the goals of um, Valhalla is bridge, bridging the gap between primitives and the rest of the Java world. So in the future, there are, there are plans to um, convert primitives to be inline types. And once this is done, then the, everything kind of fits nicely together. So um, with inline types, there are two new bytecodes introduced. Um, the first is default value. So this is a lot like the new bytecode um, for creating um, identity types. Uh, default value creates an inline type and sets all the fields to zero. Um, so all primitives are zero, all references are null. Um, and default value always produces an instantiated, an initialized uh, instance. So unlike the new bytecode where you have to do the new dupe init sequence, um, default value is sufficient to create uh, an initialized um, uh, instance of a value type. The other bytecode is with field. So as I said earlier, uh, inline types are immutable, which means you can't change the field. Um, so in order to you know, effectively uh, update an inline type, you have to create a new one with a, with a new value. So with field takes an existing inline type and creates a new one with an updated field. So now we'll take a look at some of the, some examples. Um, of, how, of what, what it's like to program with inline types. Um, their characteristics make them um, subtly different from, uh, from reference types today. And there are some cases where um, it might be a surprise to users. Um, one of these cases deal with nullability. So when, when you create an array um, today, um, you, the array elements are initialized to null. So writing code like this, um, you'd expect that as soon as you create the array, um, if you do a null check on the element, um, you, you expect that the element is null. But with inline types, when you create an array, um, since inline types are not nullable, as soon as you create the array, all the elements are initialized to a valid inline type. So if you wrote code like this, um, it wouldn't behave as you expected it to. Um, here's another example. Um, there are a lot of APIs today that accept types like object array or object. And um, today, all, all, um, all types that subclass objects are nullable. Uh, so you can assign null to them. But with inline types, that's not true. So in this example, we have a method accepts an object array and then um, writes null to the first element. Um, with inline types, you could potentially get a null pointer exception since it's illegal to write null to an, to an inline type array. So these are, these are some of the issues that can occur uh, when using inline types. Um, so there are cases where an indirection may be useful. Um, one might need to create a type that refers to itself, as in this example, or you might want to assign null. Uh, but as I said, inline types are not nullable. So there is one option. Um, the option is to use a reference projection. It's effectively the box of an inline type, but it's not really a box because a reference projection simply means that the container can contain null or an inline type. So unlike primitive boxing where you have to create a new instance, 
with an inline reference projection, you're not creating a new instance. You're simply using a projection of an inline type. So it's a much more performant model. So what is the future of Valhalla? Uh, we looked at inline types and how it can be a great benefit to performance. However, we still need to solve the issue with generics, as these are very commonly used types. Um, so in today's world, when we want to write generic code with an int, it looks something like this. Ideally, we want to get to this picture. Um, so today, there's, there's been a lot of um, prototype work, but um, nothing concrete. Um, this will likely be released after inline types. Um, but this is something that, um, the, that the expert group wants to, wants to look at in the future. So here is a roadmap. Um, LW3, this is where we are now. LW10 will be the first release of inline types, and LW100 will be the release of specialized generics. Now, there'll be many releases in between those, but those kind of serve as markers for uh, the major releases. So this concludes my presentation. Um, I hope you guys have all um, learned something new about uh, Project Valhalla today, and I'll be able to take any questions.